and uh, he has uh, uh, served as well and he's always willing to bring the word of God to us so I hope we can see him today and uh, Joe welcome to Kehidate Time. this is your house and uh, we're glad that you're with us well thank you Jorge and uh, always blessed to to participate to worship with you to daven with you all and to bring God's word um, uh, certainly with a, a heavy heart this week um, as I said, oh, always good. I always appreciate his invitation uh, to come and to, uh, to, to, to to be with you all. Um, originally, when he asked, and I, I saw that it was going to be Bereshit, my focus at the time was on, on the goodness of God. And certainly God is still good. He's good all the time. Uh, but uh, like all of you, I mean, this past week, uh, we look at what's happened with such broken heartedness and heaviness. Uh, I, I think about uh, the, 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 the word that comes to mind is uh, when, when, when Acharon, the high priest, Moses' brother, his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, were, were struck dead for violating God's holiness. Uh, we read in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3, that Vayidon uh, Acharon Acharon was was dumbfounded. He was speechless. Um, I, I think for all of us, as as we've watched, not only has the world seemed to turn upside down, but I, you know, I, I was I, I had plans to leave for a conference in Jerusalem tomorrow, and so I mean, it, it, the whole world has turned upside down. We, we we we've watched with horror and brokenheartedness as innocents have been slain as. Uh, Women and babies. And, 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 uh, now, now we look with with equal horror as innocents uh, among the Palestinian people who are being used as human shields by Hamas. And we ask ourselves, you know, how could this happen? How could something that's that's so good uh, turn into something so so terrible? Um, I, I'm not going to preach on God's goodness, but we need to remember God's goodness today because in spite of all this, God is good. Amen. He, God is good all the time. Uh, we may see terrible brokenness in the world, but, but God but God is good. Um, I'm going to go ahead to, to let, let me see if I can start this slideshow here. Um, I'm going to try to be open to the Holy Spirit today because what I had originally planned, I'm not doing <laughs> at all. So, uh, uh, as I said, God, God is good. And uh, God, when we look at Bereshit, Bereshit, not just as the opening book of the Bible, but it is a foundation for understanding who we are as human beings, for understanding what God is like, what God's character is like, uh, understanding what our mission is here on earth, and understanding what's wrong with the world and what has to be done with it. We, we speak in Hebrew about tikkon na'olam, uh, the healing of, of the universe. When we look at the brokenness that we're experiencing, the horror that we're experiencing, we need to see, as Jorge said earlier, we are a people of, of hope, of great hope, of living hope. So so, so what happened? What went wrong? And what can we do to fix and repair the brokenness around us? Very quickly, we look at God's goodness. God is good. He invested his goodness in everything that he created. We see this in the, in the creation account in chapters 1 and 2 of Rishud. God looks at it and he, and he says, it's good. It's wonderful. And then he placed us man and woman created in his image, precious to him. In the midst of that paradise, Gan Eden, uh, a paradise where we had everything we needed, no lack of food, no hurt or harm, everything we needed, it was paradise. And God gave us one commandment, one commandment. It, it, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that People want to throw off the yoke of God. They want to do their own thing. 
what we discover is the more that we do that, we aren't freer, we are more in bondage. And I think of those verses at the end of the, the book of Judges where it says, in those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You know, I don't want to get into politics, but we need to return to God. We need to repent and return to God. All of us. Uh, Justin Trudeau can't save us. Joe Biden can't save us. Netanyahu can't save us. The IDF can't save us. We need to turn back to God. One simple commandment he asked us, and when we fail to do that, all this brokenness comes into the world. On the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And certainly we, like Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, we, death and, and sickness and, and brokenness came into the world. And, and, and we've witnessed that this past week. We, we, we witnessed the symptoms of that brokenness we call sin, that separation from the God who loves us and created us in his image, who, who instilled in us a, a passion for his holiness and his justice and his righteousness that will only be satisfied as we come to him. So what went wrong? And this is hard for people that are um, naive about reality. You know, when I, I'm still an optimist. I, I believe in hope. When I was younger, I remember a, a man who discipled me, who mentored me. We would talk sometimes. He was a pastor, and I was learning from him. And we would talk sometimes about uh, struggles in the church. And I would always say, well, they mean well. And he looked at me one day and said, Joe, you need to understand some people don't mean well. It takes a while, it takes some life to begin to understand that, that there are forces behind all of this, that although the people are created in the image of God, sometimes people don't mean well. Reb Zalman Schachter once said, there is more good in the world than evil, but not by much. We need to be aware of those forces that we're seeing with horror. Where is that coming from? And we read that in the passage that we read from Horatia chapter 3, where Adam and Eve broke that commandment. They listened to the serpent. Now, who is the serpent? We can, we can make the mistake of saying this is just a little child, childlike myth here. No, we read the rest of the scripture, and it's clear who the serpent is. Again and again, we are reminded that this serpent is the evil one, the serpent of old, the devil. Yeshua refers to him as the father of lies. He's a liar. We see that in our world. It's manifest in our world. We think we're so smart. We're so modern. We're so enlightened, right? We, 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 we believe in science, not the Bible anymore. We're, we're foolish. We, we've been deceived by his lies. He's a deceiver, a liar. Worse than that, Yeshua calls him a murderer. He means business. He means to kill us, to take our souls, not just kill us physically, but to kill us spiritually. Right? He's referred to as a, as, a, as, a, as a roaring lion looking to devour you. He's not to be taken lightly. And yet, yet as we study the word, we, we can learn what his tactics are and, and uh, as tragic as this all is his tactics haven't changed you know sometimes i feel like if you have uh, a fan of uh, of peanuts uh, you, you remember the scene with charlie brown and lucy and, and and lucy sets the football up right and charlie brown you know he this time she's going to hold it this time i'm going to kick it right and every time you know it's going to happen charlie brown, brown winds up and he winds up on his rear end because Lucy lets go of the football. It's like you think he would learn. We're the same. He uses the same tactics, the same tired and yet effective tactics to deceive us, to kill us, to murder us, to destroy us. So what do we see here in this passage we just read? 
The first thing that he does is he tries to undermine our trust in God. Did God really say that? Right? We're, we're modern people. We don't take the scripture literally anymore. We've learned so much more since then. Do you hear people saying that? Even people who claim to be disciples of Yeshua. Did God really say that? Now, once he's able to instill that seed of doubt into us, everything else begins to unravel. We then see how this proceeds. Eve, Chava, says, God said, not just don't eat it, don't touch it. Now, God never said that. God didn't say don't touch it. What we see here is adding human traditions, human religion, religion traditions, religious traditions to what God said. God keeps it simple, right? The, the Ten Commandments are ten words. Very simple. The first commandment was one, one commandment. We keep adding to it with our human traditions, and our self-puffed-up arrogance. Don't even touch it. You see, we've, we need to go back to what does the word say? What did God command us? Because indeed, as we just sang, it's a tree of life for those who find it. Third thing he does. He says, you're not going to die. When you eat of it, you're going to become like God. You won't need God. Right? You won't need God. That's our world. We're, we're so filled with ourselves that we think we know the way to do it. And who needs God? And if we see God at all, it's like we, we pull God out like a, an afterthought. If all else fails, we'll pray about it. Once a week, we'll gather and we'll pray. But God's at the center of it. He is our rock, our salvation. The next breath we take is a good, gracious gift from our God. But we say, no, we will become like God. And look, Yochanan, the beloved disciple, writes in his first letter that that tactic is what he uses over and over again, what he used with Eve and with Adam. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. It's the same tactic that he uses. It looks good. It was pleasing to eat. And it fed our pride. We can be God. I don't need God. I can be God. I don't need to listen to his commandments. We create a cafeteria religion, right? We come along and say, well, I like that one, but not that one. And it's to our detriment. It's interesting what follows in the chapters in Bereshi is very depressing. Not only does sin and death come in through Adam and Eve's choice, but we see things go from bad to worse. Brothers turning on brothers and killing each other. We see terrible rise of violence and injustice. Everything that we see in the world now, to its full extent, so bad that as Bereshi chapter 6 opens, God looks and he grieves that he made the world, or that he made humanity. And he says, I see that the world has become corrupt and full of, of violence and interesting if you look at the Hebrew there the word that is translated in the English for corrupt and violence is the Hebrew word Hamas now I know Hebrew and Arabic have similar roots I'm not saying it's the same word but perhaps God is showing us something that is prophetic in that filled with violence filled with corruption filled with sexual immorality. It's the fruit of what we've chosen. And yet still, God is good. God is merciful. 
in spite of all this. God is good. God is faithful. God is merciful. We see this in this third chapter of Bereshi, at the, the darkest moment in human history. Darker than even what we're seeing today. These are the results of that day, of that choice. God shows mercy and goodness. Let me point out two things from this section that shows us that. Number one, we read that God covered Adam and Eve. Now, again, we can read that lightly, like a you know, sort of a Doctor Doolittle thing. They were they were they were uh, uh, naked, and so God covered them. It's more than that. The Hebrew word for cover and keep poor, right? Don't keep poor. The Day of Atonement. The Hebrew word for for covering is a picture of being covered to make atonement for our sins. What does God do? God offers the first blood atonement. He covers them with skins. He did for Adam and Eve what they couldn't do for themselves, what we can't do for ourselves. God graciously offered for them. And he was pointing ahead to a greater sin offering that was still to come. Without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement for sins, right? That greater atonement of the greater Adam, Yeshua, who would die on a tree for you and for me, who shed blood would atone and wash me and you, all those who will come to him clean of our sins so that we can stand before the righteous. Secondly, in this passage on the darkest day of all human history, God announces the good news. He proclaims the good news right there. It's called in the Latin Proto-Evangelium, the first announcement of the good news. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, Bereshi chapter 3. He says as he's pronouncing the curse on the snake, he speaks about the seed of the woman, the one who is to come. The evil one will strike at his heel. To wound him, pierce his heel. We know that Yeshua was, the nails were, were sent through his heels. To strike at his heel, and yet, it wasn't the end of the story. This seed of the woman still to come would crush the head of the evil one. His end was sealed. He could do some damage. He can still do damage. And yet his end is sealed. He is a defeated enemy. Do you see that? Do you see that today in the midst of this chapter of darkness? There's hope. There's great hope. That's what Jorge said earlier. We're a people of hope. We have a living hope. Right? Shimon writes to the early believers who were often going through much worse than we are, were persecuted, being, being killed for their faith, martyred. <laughs> he says, and sometimes I think, uh, Shimon, you got to get a better uh, bedside story, uh, manner here. He says, what, are you surprised? D didn't, didn't Yeshua tell us we're going to be persecuted? Why should this surprise you? As if something strange was happening. If they persecuted him, they'll persecute us. So number one, we shouldn't, although it's heartbreaking, we shouldn't be surprised. Number two, Yeshua has already overcome and is victorious. Yeshua says, in this world you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Yeah, he's a murderer and a liar, but Yeshua is the way and the truth, and he's offering us life, life abundant, even beyond the grave, eternal life. And abundant life now if we'll come to him. Here's the third thing we need to remember. Things are not as hopeless as they appear. God is still on the throne. He reigns. In spite of what the evil one tells us, we can count on his promises. He's not a man that he should change his mind or the son of man that he should lie. 
we can count on God's promises. When he says it, take it to the bank. It's good. I love that promise of prophet Jeremiah. It's a promise that is made as the Babylonian armies are coming into Judah, about to burn the temple, the first temple, Solomon's temple, about to send the people off into exile in Babylon. And yet God says, not unless the stars fall from the sky, not unless the seasons were to cease forever, will I ever forget Israel? Will Israel ever cease to be a nation before me? What a great promise. That's a promise we can count on. The fourth thing we see is that God's covenantal love and faithfulness is not just good then. It prophesies into the future of his goodness. That passage we read from Zechariah. Look at what's being described. The time when Israel is surrounded by enemies. The IDF can't save them. The UN can't save them. Not that the UN ever could save them. I have a friend who calls them the United Nonsense. <laughs> All the options are gone. And we see that God says on that day, I will pour out on Israel a spirit of supplication. And they will cry out. And they will look on him whom they've pierced. This is 700 years before Yeshua went to, to, to die for us on the tree. Centuries before God prophesies this. And looking into the future, this time that we, we don't know if it's happening today, but times like this, when things seem hopeless, God says it's not hopeless. Shaul says in this way, all of Israel will be saved. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities, for your iniquities. And in this way, all of Israel will be saved. So what can we do? This is important. There's a few things we can do. Because I know if, if you're anything like me, not only were you overcome by the horror of this past week, but there were times where you felt powerlessness. Did you feel that powerless? What can I do? I, I felt both like I should be there, and but if I'm there, they'll kill me. And if I'm you know, here, what can I do here in Canada? What can I do? Show me, Lord. A couple of things we need to remember. Number one, yes, this is a physical, but it's manifesting what we just talked about. What we saw in Hamas, what we saw in the crowds chanting in Sydney, Australia, gas the Jews, is manifesting the lies of the evil and the power of the evil one. But he doesn't have ultimate power. He's a defeated enemy. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, Shalom says. So what can we do? We need to remember that. We need to pray. I know many of you are, but don't minimize that. Prayer is not being passive. In the West, we're such activists that we feel, well, if all else fails, we'll pray, right? No, no pray. pray. Prayer is powerful. It's a powerful weapon, right? It says we can, we can demolish strongholds. The, the prayer of a, of a righteous man is effective and powerful. Pray. Begin with prayer. Continue with prayer. End with prayer. David was a, a warrior king, and yet he was a, a spiritual warrior. Rise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Prayer makes a difference. Secondly, as you pray, as you're filled with the Ruach, as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you are able to, and God leads you to, then give. Give generously as you're able to. And find for you, I'm not going to recommend things, but as Harkin mentioned, Chosen People Ministries is a ministry that is focused on the gospel and yet is doing humanitarian work along with the gospel, the hands and feet of Yeshua around the world, but especially at this point time in Israel. Uh, organizations like the uh, Magana, uh, 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 David, uh, uh, Adom, uh, 
uh, uh, organizations that you can give to that are helping at this time of crisis. You find the organizations that are right for you. And as the Lord leads you, give. Give, we've been blessed. Give from that abundance. Thirdly, and this is so important, speak out. Speak out. There's so much, so many lies and misinformation out there on the college campuses, in workplaces, wokeness that says that Israel's an apartheid racist state. Israel's not a perfect state, but it's not an apartheid state. We need to speak out. Speak the truth in love. Speak it boldly. And God will open doors if you're willing to. Yeshua says to his disciples, when the time comes, don't worry about what to say. The, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will give you the words to say. I found that even this past week. As I was struggling and grieving over what was happening and praying. Without my seeking it, two opportunities came. I'm, I'm part of the Colson Fellows here in Canada. And a monthly fellowship. And some of the directors said, would you speak? Would you take a few minutes and speak? And then lead in prayer about what's going on in the Middle East. I didn't seek that, but I realized, okay, I've got an opportunity here to speak the truth in the midst of this organization across Canada. A day later, a friend of mine, I'm involved with a ministry to, to believers and refugees from the Middle East. They were holding their annual fundraising dinner and this friend asked me, would I, would I consider coming to speak about what's happening in the land of Israel and lead in some prayer? These weren't opportunities I saw. God opened those doors. Look for those opportunities. It may just be a neighbor who's misinformed, who, someone who needs to be comforted. Speak, speak boldly, speak the truth in the love. Share your testimony. Let people know that it's God who's, who's done this. God has moved in you. There's a man that I get together with weekly for prayer. He's an Egyptian. He grew up under Nasser. A wonderful follower of Yeshua, of Jesus. And we sometimes laugh because he grew up hating Israel. He grew up learning to hate Jewish people. And Yeshua moved in his heart and changed him. We couldn't be brothers in the same way without that movement of the Holy Spirit. One of my former students is from Iran. Same thing. A wonderful believer in Yeshua, in Jesus. And we see the miracle of how God tore down the walls of hostility. And he drew to himself those who are far away and those who are near, making the two one. One new man. And here's the thing. We know how this story ends. We've read the book. We know how it ends, right? A day is coming when he will wipe away every tear. Where fear and sickness and death and war and hatred will be no more. And we'll stand before the Prince of Peace, all of us, from every tribe and every nation who belong to him, who've been redeemed by his blood. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua, Jesus, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the one who creates shalom, peace in the heavenlies, create peace for us and for all Israel and for everyone who dwells on this earth. And let us say, Amen.